You know, there's certain things about uh, Dub McClish that's just extremely irritating. <laughs> One is that he can eat whatever he wants to and never gain an ounce. And uh, for some reason, I don't, I don't understand it, even though he's older than I am, he never does look as old as I am. I don't know. He always, always looks younger. I, I, I don't understand it. Of course, he, he doesn't have my charming personality. <laughs> Dub has really been a force for good in the Brotherhood, he, even though a lot, of them, <laughs> a lot of people in the Brotherhood don't recognize it, but he's been a force for good in the Brotherhood for many, many years. And I pray quite often that it'll be many more years. <laughs> but I do, I can count too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, and I think he has a concern for those that are coming after him, that uh, they'll be able to carry on in the, uh, uh, you know, following the old paths as he has faithfully done all his many years. I think we as a brotherhood are much better for all the efforts that he has expended on behalf of the Lord. Again, there are those that don't, don't appreciate that, but uh, I think those of us here who know him and love him appreciate it very greatly. And I want to say too that uh, as much as I appreciate Dub, and I do greatly, I appreciate his good wife at least as much as I appreciate Dub. And I wish that uh, her health was much better than what it is now, because if it were, I'd have her do the proofreading instead of me. <laughs> but uh, no amen on that, I, I can see. But we really do appreciate uh, having them both here, and we do wish them many more years of, of uh, service in the kingdom, we will be better for it, and uh, I know, you know, that the uh, Lord, the kingdom itself, will be uh, much better for it. So Dub is going to speak to us uh, tonight on what is the restoration principle, and is that principle scripture? Is it authorized in the scriptures? So Dub, speak to us. Your pleasure. Go on. Forty minutes. Well, I wonder if Ken is ill tonight. He was too nice. <laughs> Something not quite right about that. <clears throat> I appreciate what he had to say, and I wish uh, at least half of it were deserved, uh, except for what he said about LaVon. That's all amply deserved. I've told some of you, uh, we um, had a brother in San Angelo back in the 1960s where we lived at the time who when I preached a sermon he thought was halfway decent, his uh, way of complimenting it was to say, as he left the building that morning, I, I see levon has been writing your sermons again. <laughs> and I took that as a compliment, and uh, she has a big part in uh, a lot of the sermons that I write. In fact, one reason Ken doesn't have to do much when he gets a manuscript from us is because of Levon. <laughs> we uh, are enjoying being at the uh, Roth B&B &B, as usual. Uh, you might call it the B&B B&B, &B, I guess. But they are so hospitable and we uh, feel like we're family out there and we deeply appreciate them. We thank you so much here at Spring for continuing faithfully and may uh, that have many, many more years. May it continue till the Lord comes. And your help with our work in a very uh, real and material way is greatly appreciated. I uh, know that I have only a limited amount of time to speak. In spite of all of the nice things that Ken said, he still has a timer in his hand. And, so we need to get into our study tonight. It's an important study. And it's a twofold question. What is the restoration principle? And is 
the restoration principle scriptural. First one of these questions, what is the restoration principle? I want to approach from a very uh, practical standpoint to try to illustrate it. I learned to drive in a 1938 Ford pickup. It rolled off the assembly line the same time I discovered America. And I was 14 years old at the time my father bought that old truck and it was beat up about 1951. He signed for me to get my driver's license when I was 14. And that old truck and I became amiable companions for a couple of years. I liked it just fine, I've often thought you know, it would be fun to find one of those old trucks and restore it. And I did some internet searches on that model, and I found some that were old rusted out hulks, been in barns and out in the weather and so forth for years. Also found some beautiful restorations. And then I found pictures of many trucks that had begun as 1938 Ford pickups but they were unrecognizable because of the additions and the renovations and the subtractions from the original. To truly restore that old truck, you would have had to put a V8 motor carbureted into it, a three-speed transmission with a long floor stick, mechanical brakes, bench seat, a lot of other things that we don't have in our vehicles today. Owners of those altered trucks had chopped and lowered and customized them in a variety of ways. They'd added air conditioning, power steering, power brakes, power windows, power door locks, all the fancy electronic equipment and gimmicks and gadgets that we think are necessities in our modern vehicles. Those show trucks Street rods were probably a joy to drive, fine to look at, but they were hardly 1938 Ford pickups. In my parable of the pickup now, I've illustrated the principle of restoration. Now let me state the principle explicitly. Restoration implies, number one, the existence of an original. One cannot restore something that never existed. Number two, restoration implies the loss of the original state of that which is to be restored. And number three, restoration implies the existence of information concerning the specifications of the original by which it might be restored. The restoration principle is the employment of those original specifications to replicate the original without addition, subtraction, or other variance. Of course, the initial question in my title goes beyond the mere principle of restoring something in general. Our interest tonight has to do with restoring something in religion, particularly the religion of Jesus Christ. The fuller statement of the question then is, what is the restoration principle as it relates to religion? The particulars involved in restoring a 1938 Ford pickup apply with equal force to this larger and more significant question, however. And in applying the principle of restoration in the realm of religion, some questions are in order now. Number one, was there an original church of Jesus Christ? Well, we know the answer to that question. Every speaker just about it has already answered it, going back to Matthew 16, verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, the Lord said. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. His church kingdom became a reality after his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven at the right hand of the Father. That, of course, we have detailed in Acts chapter 2 in the Pentecost sermon of Peter. 
The number in this church increased greatly on that day by about 3,000, Luke tells us. And its numerical, geographical, and spiritual growth are recorded throughout the remainder of the book of Acts and through the epistles. The second thing about the principle applied to religion is, was the original state of the church lost and corrupted by human innovation? Well, to ask is to answer. Attempts to alter the church afflicted it almost before it was begun. I think the Lord knew the devil would do everything he could to keep him from establishing the church, and doubtless he thought he had done it by getting him crucified. The seeds of corruption appeared in the first century, as evidenced by the great Jerusalem discussion over the subject of circumcision, the Jew, uh, Jewish Christians trying to bind it on the saints, Acts chapter 15. And then the epistles are filled with examples of those who were trying to corrupt it. Uninspired church history beginning in the second century gives all sorts of evidence of the corruptions of men and hundreds of books of church history uninspired can tell us that story if we'll read it. It's worship, it's organization, how one becomes a part of it, everything about it men have touched and corrupted. Modern religious bodies claiming to honor Christ are nothing more than severe, unrecognizable distortions and travesties of the original that our Lord established. And the third question about this uh, principle and its application to religion is, does information that is a pattern, a blueprint, a model, a written description exist of the way the original was? Indeed it does. Which information constitutes the bulk of the New Testament beginning in Acts 2 and verse 42 and continuing through the end of the New Testament? We learn from that blueprint, our pattern, the means of entrance, the day of assembly, the acts of worship, the congregational organization, the work that the Lord left his church to do, and the destiny of that church if it is faithful. These things are set forth in the beginning, in the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude describes it in verse 3. Now this brings us to look at the second question in our title. Is the restoration principle scriptural? That is, does the New Testament authorize the restoration of the church when it has been corrupted? Is this principle in harmony with scripture? Does scripture allow or encourage the application of the restoration principle to matters religious? Again, to ask this question is to answer it for those who know anything about the New Testament. Unfortunately, many professed believers read the Bible but fail to see this truth. And not all of these professed believers are outside the Church of Christ. Sometimes it's doctrinal bias. Sometimes it's loyalty to a man. Sometimes it's ignorance and superficial study. But for whatever reason, Men have not grasped the idea of restoration, or having grasped it, they have surrendered it. Not only do the scriptures authorize, allow, and encourage employment of the restoration principle, they actually demand its employment. The mandate, of course, implies the possibility of restoring the purity and doctrine and practice and the maintenance of that purity for the church once it has been lost. Some recognize and understand the restoration principle all too well, but deny either the desirability or necessity, and some even the possibility, of implementing it. In 1961, we lived uh, near Wichita Falls, Texas, a little town of Iowa Park. And I would, from time to time, engage the local Presbyterian preacher. He was uh, about my age, or young 20s in uh, some religious discussions. 
And we were talking one day, and I said, Boyd, don't you understand that we need the first century church? We need to restore the first century church. He said, no, Dub said, we don't need a first century church. We need a 20th century church. Well, little did I imagine at that time would, the time would come when we would have a rather large number, an influential number, within our own ranks who would be saying the same thing. Only they've changed the century. We need a 21st century church. These folk condescendingly view as simplistic and naive those who still sound forth the need for restoration. We sound it forth to those in false religious systems and bodies. They think that we're being judgmental and that we're doing something unnecessary and we are uh, narrow-minded. We're trying to recreate the church of the 50s, some of them say. No, we're trying to recreate, restore the church in its pristine, original, primitive state. These brethren view restoration only as a never-ending and never-attainable process and pursuit. It's like those who started saying back in the 1960s, you cannot really know the truth. You can just always be searching for the truth and trying to find the truth. And this, of course, in spite of what the Lord has plainly said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8 and verse 32. Those who say that some of us claim to have restored the church labor under an illusion that we just think that we have restored the church. It really cannot be done. And most of the universities founded by our brethren to keep just such things as these from happening have been infested with those who are making them happen, saying that we cannot we should not make an effort to restore the church. Well, how do we substantiate the proposition that it is scripturally authorized that we restore the church when it has been lost to corruption? Let's look at the evidence. By no means all of it, but some of it. Let's go back to the Old Testament for some principles. What was the function of the prophets of the Mosaical age? When God gave the law to and through Moses, he demanded that Israel comply with it fully. After all, he gave 10 commandments, not 10 suggestions or recommendations. Moses' edict in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 is representative <clears throat> of scores, if not hundreds, of statements that set forth the same principle, though in different words. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Jehovah your God, which I command you this day. Moses warned Israel before they crossed the Jordan and entered into Canaan, which he was not privileged to do, that they must faithfully keep the law of God once they entered into Canaan. As Joshua, Moses' successor, neared his appointment with death, he warned God's people to, quote, keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not either to the right or to the left. Joshua 23 and verse 6. They followed Joshua's charge, but only for a while another generation or two before apostasy became the norm in the period of the judges. And there we have them time after time going through the cycle of apostasy and finally they would cry out so loudly and repent, God would send a judge and for a few years they would be faithful again and then the cycle kept on repeating. Then came the kings following the judges. And with few exceptions, either before or after the kingdom divided, was there a king who was steadfast in keeping the law of God? With apostasy on every hand, God began sending prophet after prophet after prophet. This is what gave us the books of the prophecy in the Old Testament for the most part. 
They were God's attempt to call men back to restore his true religion among his people of that era. Some of these prophets are unnamed. They were just godly and good men that did the work that God sent them to do. But it was God's work of restoration, it's what he was trying to accomplish through those prophets. Almost a millennium after the days of Moses, God stated the following to Jeremiah, one of the last of those prophets before God would give them up to the Babylonians, the kingdom of Judah anyway. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning with verse 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff. They did worse than their fathers. It is evident that God considered restoration of his Old Testament religion to be desirable, essential, and therefore possible and attainable because he mandated that restoration. He did all that he, can without, he could without absolutely taking control of the will of those people which he limits himself from doing. One of those kings, an exception to all of those unrighteous kings, was Josiah, as we know. And his work and his uh, rulership, his domain, was the bright light in the kingdom of Judah. You can read of him in two accounts, 2 Kings chapter 22, 21 through 23 actually, and 2 Chronicles chapters 34 and 35. He's called the restorer king, and for good reason. He found the religion of God in shambles. He found the temple all corrupted and broken down and deserted. And he determined that it would not so continue. Now, had liberal brethren been around when he reigned, they would doubtless have made great sport of Josiah's efforts, even as they do those today who insist on restoring the original. It's not difficult to imagine the way they would have ridiculed righteous Josiah, attack and destroy the false religions, publicly commit yourself to obeying God's word, clean up and repair the temple, and reinstitute, uh, reinstitute the Passover? Who do you think you are? Your father's never attempted to do this. Don't you know you'll be opposing the whole nation? And don't you understand how extreme and radical your plan is? Don't you see how the religions around us will ridicule us as narrow-minded and judgmental when they hear you declare that there's only one true religion? Don't you realize you cannot actually restore true religion once it's lost and that any restoration you think you accomplish is only an illusion? Josiah knew no better than to believe that he could restore the worship of God just as God had given it through Moses. So he set about doing that. Well, what was God's attitude toward Josiah and his efforts? God apparently delighted in those efforts. At the beginning of his reign, we read in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 2, And he did that which was right in the eyes of Jehovah, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Those are the very words that Joshua had charged his people to follow as he was nearing death. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Well into Josiah's restoration work, the inspired writer evaluated him thus. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to Jehovah with all his heart, with all his soul, all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like unto him. 2 Kings 23 and verse 25. Josiah's work of restoration was manifestly then right in the eyes of Jehovah as has been the same godly effort in any generation or century when God's church, God's religion has been corrupted. 
What does it involve? It involves a steering a steady course in the way of truth. Rejecting errors of lawmakers on one hand or lawbreakers on the other hand. It involves constantly asking, is this according to the law of God? Is this authorized by God? After all, the song that we sang tonight is based upon that very authority passage, isn't it, from Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. If true religion could be and was restored almost nine centuries after God gave the law through Moses, then true religion as established by Christ can and also ought to be restored centuries after his church has been corrupted by philosophies and traditions of men. And God will always have it so. But let's notice the fact that God is a God of patterns. Perhaps the only thing liberals, especially in the church, despise more than the concept of being called narrow-minded or afraid that someone will call them narrow-minded is the concept of patternism, as they call it. Pattern theology, they refer to it, or referring to us as patternists. However, they make sport of God's word when they do that. They don't just make sport of us. God's word contains patterns it has from the beginning. God had a pattern for Adam and Eve in the garden. He had a pattern of worship, as we learn from Cain and Abel. Gave Noah a pattern for the ark. The Old Testament system, of course, given through Moses is literally filled with patterns, scores of them. It's made up of them. The Hebrews writer asserts this fact in calling attention to the tabernacle pattern in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Relating to the Mosaical priesthood, he said of those priests that they serve that which is a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Even as Moses is warned of God when he is about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the dirty word pattern that God showed thee in the mount. Well, that's a direct quotation from Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. For God did so charge Moses in the midst of giving him all of the intricate details for the tabernacle, its furniture, and all of the appurtenances. This passage refers to that detailed blueprint very obviously. The mention of the tabernacle to these Hebrew Christians, however, is not to entice them or instruct them to recreate another tabernacle like that old tabernacle. Contrarywise, he mentioned it to further his argument to these Jewish brethren on the verge of deserting Christ to go back to Moses from whom they had escaped that they dare not do it. And so he uses the tabernacle of the old to make an argument concerning the new. Throughout most of this epistle, one finds the running argument that Christ the gospel, his way, the New Testament are vastly superior to that of the Mosaical Covenant and that they are actually the fulfillment of that which had come before. The statement in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5 is an important part of the author's argument in the Hebrews letter. We may frame it in a familiar if-then formula. If God had a pattern for the inferior institution, the tabernacle, the priesthood, of the law of Moses, which he did, Hebrews 8, 5, then it follows that he has a pattern for the superior institution, which is the church and the law of Christ. The argument is from the lesser to the greater. And it is a powerful argument. The writer immediately states in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 8 
But now he, referring to Christ, hath obtained a ministry the more excellent by so much as he also is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted upon better promises. It is neither logical nor biblical to conclude that God had an unalterable pattern for the lesser institution, but Jesus allowed men to just construct his superior institution, the church, any way they wanted to do it. The Hebrews letter also emphasized the God's commands for his people under the New Testament were just as strong that they must keep it as they had been under the old. Read chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, that's the law of Moses, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, <clears throat> reward how shall we escape, we under the New Testament, if we neglect so great a salvation. And then again in chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. A man that said it not Moses' law dieth without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, think ye, shall he be judged worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Again, the if-then formula serves to enforce what the writer is saying. If God was so concerned about strict adherence to his pattern for the inferior law of Moses and its institutions, then he is even more concerned about strict adherence to his pattern for the superior law of his son, including the church. And God has a pattern for the church as surely as he had a pattern for the tabernacle is undeniable. As one traces the establishment of various congregations and the descriptions and characteristics of them, as we begin seeing the, the church unfolded before us from Acts 2 on through the epistles, one sees a pattern of the terms upon which men could enter that institution when the church was to meet, what it was to do when it met, what its organization was to be on the local level, which is the only level of organization there is in the New Testament church, and every other thing pertaining to it. And so the restoration principle is scriptural because God is a God of patterns. And when the pattern has been uh, departed from, corrupted, the original can still be replicated. Then there are the implications of personal restorations. By that I mean an individual can be restored. When brethren stray from the Lord's way, it is desirable, necessary, and possible, at least in some cases, to restore them. This is so unless one wants to advocate a once an apostate, always an apostate, which is a peculiar twist on uh, perseverance of the saints that uh, Calvin came up with. Restoring fallen brethren is desirable for many reasons. Most of all, restoring the fallen is necessary if that one is to be saved who has gone astray. We're therefore commanded to do our best to restore those who go astray. Galatians 6, 1 says so plainly, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of gentleness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, we will not restore everyone who goes astray, because those who've gone astray still have their free will, and they can remain obstinate in their apostasy if they choose. But it doesn't mean we cannot restore anyone who's gone astray. So restoration is possible for the individual Christian who apostatizes. If one brother who strays can actually be restored, can two be restored? And not merely be an illusion of a restoration? What if a church of 200 goes astray? What if it apostatizes? Is it desirable and necessary to seek the restoration of all the 200? 
or just of one individual who might go astray here and there? Is it possible to achieve its restoration? Well, now this is more difficult, as many of us know. When an entire congregation starts headed to the left, it usually goes further and further to the left, and it's very rare that it can be restored, but that doesn't mean it's impossible to restore it. It just simply means that the devil has such a hold on them that they like what they're doing, the direction they're going, they're going to keep going that way. It's their choice. Does not the possibility of the restoration of one or two apostates or of, an or of an entire congregation of apostates argue that if the entire church has been corrupted over the centuries, that the church itself can be restored. Indeed, it does. And of course, it is desirable, just as it's desirable for the individual who has gone astray to be restored. And then there are the implications of doctrinal purity and what the New Testament emphasizes about that. And that surely applies to what we're talking about tonight. If restoration is unnecessary or if it's uh, impossible, what is the purpose of the relentless emphasis of the New Testament on being faithful to the truth? of continuing in the sound doctrine, of submitting one's will every day that we live to the will of Christ. The incessant emphasis on strict adherence to the word of God and the numerous warnings about departing therefrom all argue the restoration of men who go astray in religion. Those baptized upon believing the gospel were to be taught all of the Lord's commands, not just some of them, in that first generation and to the end of the world. Mark 16 verses 15 and 16 and Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. These passages further demonstrate powerfully that the Lord has a pattern for his religion that he intends men to follow that pattern and if the foregoing is not plain enough Paul's instruction to Timothy should be. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. He says, the things which thou hast heard from me, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see, it's just to be an unending process and cycle. The Son of God intended that men of every generation should hand down the pure gospel to every succeeding generation without interruption or corruption. All of the Lord's people are under divine mandate to speak and even think alike in at least some things, brethren. Surely Paul made this clear in the beginning of his first letter to the Corinthians. Speak the same thing. Be of the same mind, the same judgment. No divisions among you. He's not talking about the color of paint on the walls or carpet on the floor, what time we meet or what songbook we use. He's talking about essentials that we have no freedom to vary from. Our Savior apparently has a pattern for his church. Otherwise, he would not have inspired Paul to preach the same message in every church, 1 Corinthians 4, 17. If you don't have an asterisk by that passage, you ought to put one there. I teach the same thing everywhere in every church. Our Savior apparently then does have a pattern. We remain under the mandate Paul wrote to Timothy as he left him in Ephesus to charge men not to teach a different doctrine, 1 Timothy 1, 3. Now, there are various man-made perverted gospels, as Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 1, which are different gospels, but not another gospel of the same kind that he had brought to them. And whosoever he be, angel, apostle, or any other man who preaches you a different gospel, or you receive a different gospel from, is under the curse of God. It is not only possible to recognize and be obedient to the faith as a great company of the priests were in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, but we must also contend earnestly for the faith, the entire body of gospel doctrine, Jude verse 3. And then there's the seed principle. In his parable of the sword, Jesus likened the heart conditions of various men to various kinds of soil. 
Luke chapter 8. He identified the seed in the parable as the word of God. That's the seed of the kingdom, the church. And whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap is a principle that begins in Genesis with the physical creation. And Paul states it is just as viable in the spiritual realm, Galatians 6 and verse 7. If men preach and practice the same gospel, the apostles preached and practiced, they cannot produce any other religious body. Some denials of the possibility of restoration may be rooted in a more fundamental denial. Denials that men are able to arrive at an accurate understanding of New Testament truth, as we've mentioned. We just have to always be trying to find it and never can really come up with it. Brethren, there's some things we must know and understand and we can know. Does any human being know everything? No, not at all. But there are some things that we can know and must know. What did Peter say on Pentecost? Read it in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Poor old Peter, he just didn't know any better. It may be, however, that anti-restoration liberals very well know that men are capable of understanding the meaning of God's word and can arrive at true conclusions regarding it. In line with their denominational compatriots, though, they have decided that God does not mean what he says. This being so, their contention that it is impossible to restore the church is merely a camouflage claim. Behind that mask, they understand the word all too well. Their real conviction is it just doesn't matter. That's why some of our brethren have decided that there's not any real hell. God just didn't really mean that about fire and brimstone and torment and eternity and that sort of thing regarding the sinners. But the restoration principle is nothing more really, brethren, than faithful fulfillment of what we call the Great Commission. To go into all the world, preach the gospel of the whole creation. If we do that, we'll keep the church restored, be faithful. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's how the church became corrupt. Somewhere along the line there, second century, somewhere along there, brethren started not teaching all things that the Lord had commanded us. And so the church was lost for all practical purposes. What is the restoration principle? It's preaching and being faithful to the word. Is it authorized? It's not only authorized, it's mandated. Thank you. That was just an excellent uh, lesson, Dub. Really appreciate that. I know that uh, many of the speakers uh, have, on occasion, uh, commended the eldership here at Spring. Yeah, whether it's deserved or not is uh, really not the issue. I think it's uh, more the fact that that you appreciate an eldership that will stand behind, support and if necessary, stand in front of those who uh, boldly proclaim the truth. Now, there are those elderships that are going to wake up on the resurrection morn and be very surprised as to where they're going to spend their eternity solely, if for no other reason, for the way that they have treated preachers who have been faithful to the word. And Dub is one of those who, <laughs> who has been the brunt of a lot of those elderships, sad to say. I know that the number of you in this uh, congregation that are, that are in this uh, building tonight that are preachers have suffered the same fate that uh, uh, Dub has suffered. Shame on those elderships. And if nothing else, we uphold the arms of the righteous proclaimer of truth then 
at least in that respect, we've done our job. And I hope that the uh, Lord will at least allow this congregation to continue a uh, solid eldership for many more years. And that all that time, David will continue in full health and vigor. And, and like I say, you know, I can count years just like anybody else. But as long as uh, the Lord allows it, I hope that we are here to be able to uh, boldly proclaim the truth. Dub, I really appreciate uh, that lesson. And as I say, it's uh, my uh, prayer, and I know uh, uh, I met uh, Jack and Buddy also, that you have many, many more years of faithful service to the Lord. We'll be the beneficiary of it. And I might add, you know, that we are actually the uh, um, sponsor, if you will. You know, we handle his funds and so forth. And I think he uh, chose us for that because he knows that we'll stand behind him as long as he stands for the truth. Amen. And you, I don't think you've had to worry about, you know, uh, at least the handling of the funds. <laughs> the source of it, sometimes you have to worry about that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we'll uphold the, the uh, arms of anyone who uh, will stand behind the truth. Not on David, but anyone of you that will do that. <laughs>